The date, September 3rd, 2023. The tournament, Mayasuma Top 14, a Japanese major held in Osaka, Kansai. The set, Losers Round 4. Senra, the Jigglypuff, versus Toriguri, a player who mains Banjo and Kazooie. The winner of this set makes Top 8, Loser's side. Going into Mayasuma Top 14, you likely could have guessed a lot of things. The winner was Mia, who is now considered one of the, if not the, best players in the entire world. The other Top 8 finishers are rounded out by common names like Rizeyasu, Alice, Showers, and Tsubaki. But what no one could have guessed coming into Mayasuma Top 14 was that history was about to be made. Because, for the first time in the game's competitive lifespan, something that no one ever considered possible was about to happen. Before everyone's very eyes, Banjo and Kazooie had the best shot ever of making top 8 at a major. In a world dominated by top tiers like Steve, Sonic, and Game & Watch, the game's competitive scene seems to be sending a very clear message. Pick a top tier or fail. DeBuzz and Peanut are both picking up Steve. SkyJ is picking up Kazuya. MKLeo is picking up Rob. Never has the game been less open to success from any character not at the top, but one player denied all of that. This player challenged the fate dealt to him and his true soul main. He played who he wanted and never looked back. And more than that, he was determined to succeed with this character. Which brings us back to Mayasuma Top 14. This player was about to change history, to spit in the face of the meta entirely and single-handedly change the fate of his character forever. But how did we get here? How did a character, considered by many to be bottom tier and even as far down as bottom 5 in the entire game, make it to the top 8 qualifier of a major? Today, we'll be going over exactly how and the one player solely responsible for it. This is the tale of Toriguri, the best banjo in the world. Hey, what's up? I've always wanted to say that. And just a reminder before we begin that if you want to support me monetarily, you can do so by using the links to my channel memberships or Patreon in the description down below. Alright, with that said, let's get into today's video. Banjo and Kazooie was one of the most requested characters to be added in Smash for maybe the series' entire life. Even when Sakurai was polling on a small website asking for characters people wanted to see in Smash 2, which would eventually become Melee, people wanted Banjo. For a long time, it wasn't feasible, as Banjo was a third-party character ever since Nintendo sold Rare, the company that made Banjo games, over to Microsoft. But with Snake's addition in Super Smash Bros. Brawl, third-party characters became a regularity within the series. And ever since then, the Banjo for Smash crowd piped up and never quieted down. But even throughout Brawl, Smash 4, and the base roster of Ultimate, Banjo was simply skimmed over. Why? Well, perhaps part of it is because Banjo's popularity is actually pretty focused in North America. Over in Japan, where Sakurai and his team are based, Banjo was not nearly as popular of a request for Smash Bros, with more people over there begging for a Dragon Quest rep rather than Banjo. And when Nintendo added Hero, multiple Dragon Quest protagonists, on June 12th, 2019, it seemed like we had lost a lot of hope for Banjo ever being added. And then they added Banjo. In a true surprise, Nintendo announced Banjo and Kazooie would be coming as DLC characters in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate in the exact same direct that they announced Hero, in a move that was meant to please both the Japanese and North American crowds. And let me tell you, it worked. When I tell you that this trailer may have had the most hype out of any in Smash history, I'm not exaggerating. Who else can they add? Ah! No! 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 No way! 
This trailer was one of the peaks of hype in this game's entire lifespan, and many people immediately proclaimed themselves to be Banjo mains through and through. When Banjo was finally released, many people had a blast playing him and thought that he was great. I mean, multiple projectiles, an insanely good invincible side B, and multiple jumps. What's not to love? Shortly after Banjo released, Tweak picked up the character and piloted him at Glitch 7, a major tournament that was taking place. At Glitch 7, Tweak had three stream sets with the character. Against Lucario main Prettiest Girl, Tweak took Game 1 and then lost Game 2. Not willing to be upset so early on in the tournament, Tweak swapped off of Banjo and onto PT in Game 3 and won the set. Afterwards, Tweak went up against Dark Wizzy, clutching out a Game 5 to make it into Top 8. But wait, Rister, I hear you all saying, I thought you said Banjo and Kazooie had never made Top 8 at a Major. Well, I'll get back to that in a second. Tweak, after making Top 8, would lose back-to-back -back sets, losing 3-1 to ESAM in Winner's Semi-Finals, a set where Tweak used solo Banjo, before dropping down into Losers and losing 3-0 to DeBuzz, a set where Tweak didn't use Banjo at all and instead went solo PT. But I thought this was a video about Torty Goody, you're probably saying to yourself. Why the heck are we talking about Tweak back when he had hair longer than his character crisis? Well, because this, for a long time, was Banjo's peak. Tweak's 5th place finish was technically the first time that Banjo made top 8 at a major. But why don't we make a big deal out of this like we do for Toady Goody's eventual wins and placements? Well, it's a tad complicated, but I actually have a pretty good analogy for this. Banjo making top 8 at a major in Ultimate is a lot like Sheik winning a major in Melee. Technically speaking, the first Sheik in Melee to ever win a major was Captain Jack at MLG San Francisco 2004. However, you still see myriads of people saying that the first Sheik to ever win a major was JMook at Genesis 9. Why? Because Captain Jack's win was so early in the game's lifespan that people debate whether or not it should really be counted as a major or counted as a major win for Sheik in the context of today's melee scene. A scene that has, I think it's safe to say, exploded with skill that far exceeds those early days of melee. But melee has been out for nearly two decades. With a gap that large, it's fairly understandable that Captain Jack's win is often disregarded when talking about Sheik's major wins. Why does the same apply here to Tweak and Banjo? Well, take Captain Jack winning with Sheik early in the game's lifespan, replace Captain Jack with Tweak and Sheik with Banjo, and most importantly, replace game's lifespan with Banjo's lifespan. Glitch 7 happened on September 14th, 2019, and although Banjo was revealed on June 12th, he wasn't actually released until September 4th of 2019. This was long before the days of Sakurai hosting a character demo and then, at the very end, saying, by the way, they're going to be released tonight. No, this is back in the days where characters were revealed months before they were released, and Banjo was only out for 10 days before Glitch 7 went down. Any other fighting game probably wouldn't have even had Banjo legal for this tournament. Think of Multiverses, for example. When Evo hosted Multiverses, the Iron Giant was released for the game very shortly before Evo went down. In response? The Iron Giant was banned at Evo because no one knew whether or not he'd be insanely broken. And if he was, there was no way he'd be patched before Evo took place. Not to mention that no one there had time to learn the matchup. In any other fighting game, Banjo probably would have been banned at Glitch 7 for the exact same reasons. But as we all know, the Smash community is allergic to banning characters for any reason ever. Many would argue that Tweak matchup checked a lot of his opponents with Banjo, given how he'd only recently been released. And while I won't say that's the reason why Tweak won these sets, there's no question that unfamiliarity definitely helped him. But there's another reason why Tweak's win here isn't generally counted. The same reason why Sheik in Melee never truly won a major until JMook. It's because he wasn't a solo main. A lot of Tweak's run at Glitch 7 was with his then main Pokemon Trainer, not with Banjo. The most notable set to use Banjo was probably his victory over Dark Wizzy, where it got the most usage game-wise. In the melee scene, Sheik mains won many majors over many years, but never was able to do so as a solo main, always needing either a Fox or a Marth or something to close the gaps that Sheik just wasn't able to. The same thing applies here for Tweak. And there's one more factor working against Tweak's run at Glitch 7. It's the fact that Tweak's banjo basically dropped off the face of the earth after Glitch 7. 
If Tweak had become a Banjo main after this tournament, this top 8 finish would probably be counted, and Tweak would have made many more with the character afterward. But Tweak dropped Banjo and dropped him hard, going from a top 8 finish to quite literally extinct. Why? Well, there's three reasons. The first is the fact that, in March of the very next year, 2020, the world was shut down thanks to one particularly naughty virus. Tweak may have been interested in the character when he came out, but clearly had no interest playing him online. The second reason is that Tweak found a new love in the form of Diddy Kong, trading the bear for the monkey and piloting that character to its highest ever peaks once in-person competition returned. But the third reason is the most significant. Tweak had realized something, something that the majority of the Smash community was very quickly realizing as well. Banjo kind of sucks. When Banjo first released, many people assumed that he'd be a phenomenal character. Why? Well, because he was DLC. You gotta understand where the community was coming from at this point. For many players, Smash 4 was still a recent memory. That game saw two DLC characters, Cloud and Bayonetta, become the uncontested top two in that game. Even the DLC characters that didn't reach those heights, like Corrin or Ryu, were still solid top tiers, just not top five. In Smash Ultimate, Plant was technically a bonus, not really a DLC character, so that doesn't really count. However, even then, the first DLC character in Smash Ultimate was Joker, who, upon his release, was widely considered to be the best character in the entire game for a hot minute until his first nerf. And in between Joker and Banjo was Hero. And yes, while we now know that Hero is by no means broken, when he was first released, everyone thought that this character would break the game. With a plentiful menu of spells, one of which healed you, some of which buffed you, and two of which could kill you at literally 0%, a lot of people actually wanted Hero banned when he first released because they thought he was that overpowered and broken. Banjo had the very hard task of following up on Joker and Hero, and even when he was released, some people noticed that he felt, for lack of a better term, less DLC than Hero or Joker. I'm sad, I feel like nothing zany happened. Yeah, it's just not a zany character. Man, yeah, it's kind of boring. No, I don't. I would, he's not boring. I think he's fun to play, but it's just like, oh yeah, that makes sense that that happened. Yeah. Whereas like when we played Hero, I I did not understand any of that nonsense, and it was an adrenaline rush. It was a thrill. Banjo was one of the most wanted characters in the history of Smash, but as time moved on, people not only realized that this character was underwhelming in comparison to the other DLC fighters, they realized that he was actually kind of bad. This was before the revolutions of egg ladders and stylish drag down combos, mind you, so for a lot of people, Banjo was just a stray hit character with projectiles that was just a watered down version of Snake's grenades or Falco's lasers. And so, with Tweak dropping the character entirely, he was left with no reps when the world went into lockdown in 2020. With better DLC characters like Terry Bogard coming out, Banjo quickly faded into irrelevancy. Even the players who had begged for this character for years of their life and had pronounced themselves Banjo mains when he was revealed, quickly dropped him with a frown of disappointment on their faces and went back to their old mains just as quickly as they had previously dropped them. And for a long time, that's where Banjo stayed. Banjo enjoyed brief usage as a niche online character, but in my opinion, this actually hurt the character more than it helped him. Banjo was known as a character that vastly benefited from online's added lag and delay, and therefore was discredited as an online gimmick that would never work in an offline tournament. Ultimately, this hurt the character's reputation more and more, and eventually Banjo was permanently listed as one of the game's bottom tier characters, and even worse than that, as nothing more than a Wi-Fi gimmick. That guy is really fucking good. Good God, I fucking hate his dumb nose! Stop going in my face, you fucking <laughs> trumpet bear! Why must you exist? I used to love your game. I used to love Banjo Kazooie, and then you were introduced, and I was hype, and now you're in it, and I fucking hate myself. GG's. However. Everything would change for Banjo and Kazooie when one player entered the scene. And now, finally, over 10 minutes into the video, it's time to actually begin talking about the main subject of today's video, Tootie Goody. 
Toriguri is a Japanese Smash player originating from Kanto, and like every single Japanese legend, got his start on Smashmate, the online ladder service in Japan. This grind is where Toriguri got his start, and while this wouldn't happen until much later, according to the Smash Wiki, TG peaked on Smashmate with a ranking of 2411 and being ranked third in the 20th Smashmate season. However, this isn't where Toriguri started off. It would take many months of grinding and competing for that to actually happen. Instead, Toriguri started with some simple grinding and with simple Wi-Fi tournaments. Somewhat fulfilling the stereotype of Banjo being an online character, Toriguri got his start in Wi-Fi weeklies, participating in his very first one on May 21st, 2021, although TG had likely been grinding Smashmate for a decent chunk before this. Why do I say that? Well, because Toriguri got third at this tournament, not something players usually do for their very first tournament. Toriguri began to grind out these weekly Wi-Fi tournaments, mostly the Mayasuma and Tamisuma series, only placing outside of the top 8 twice during this span. First at Tamisuma Championship 5, where he got 33rd, and at Mayasuma Champion Series 9, where he got 9th. However, both of these tournaments were far larger and far more important than your standard Wi-Fi weekly. You can think of them kind of like the coin box if you want to. Toriguri kept competing in these weeklies until, on November 7th of 2021, Toriguri finally won his very first, winning Mayasuma 270, and then, just a little under a month later on December 3rd of 2021, won another, Mayasuma 279. These two first place finishes were surrounded by other weeklies, including one where Toriguri yet again finished outside of the top 8, placing 9th at Mayasuma Champions Series 10. But Toriguri wanted to expand past these Wi-Fi weeklies, much like many Wi-Fi warriors eventually want to. But while other Wi-Fi warriors start at locals or regionals in the area, Toriguri had other plans in mind. You see, TG wanted to either go big or go home, where he'd probably play more Wi-Fi now that I'm thinking about it. So, Toriguri said screw it and went to Kagari B6. Kagari B6 took place in the beginning of 2022, starting on January 8th. As far as the top 8 goes, it was a pretty standard Japanese tournament, at least for the time being. But that's not what we're concerned about. Our hero, Toriguri, came into the over 700 entrant tournament as the 325th seed. Toriguri defeated his round 1, Tetsu, as seeded, before getting two impressive upsets. Firstly, TG defeated Nohoho 3-0, a Ness and Lucas main, who was the 188th seed. After this, Toriguri got a much bigger upset, defeating the Ice Climbers and Min Min main Kurumis in another 3-0. Kurumis was the 69th seed, nice, and given that TG was the 325th seed, this was an impressive upset to be sure. After this though, Toriguri lost to Paisetimon 3-0, where he dropped into losers and ironically defeated Nohoho again, this time 3-1, before losing to Atelier 3-0 for a final placement of 97th as the 325th seed at his very first major tournament. And these losses are not bad at all, but with both of them being kind of polar opposites. Paisetimon was the 60th seed, but actually went on to place 3rd at the entire event. Atelier placed 33rd, but was the 5th seed only being in losers so early because he was upset extremely early on in bracket. So, in short, Toriguri lost to 3rd place and the 5th seed for 97th. Quite a rough draw for your very first major tournament, but that's just how it is in Japan. Now, I'm not going to go over every major that TG enters in this amount of depth, but I wanted to at least do the first one, so that we can see how far Toriguri has come by the time we get to the end of this video and his most recent major. However, after Kagari B6, Toriguri would enter a sort of pattern. The only offline events he entered would be either majors or large regionals, and in between, he'd keep grinding out the Wi-Fi tournaments he'd been previously entering. After Akagari B6, Toriguri entered 10 online tournaments, not placing outside the top 6 at any of them. His next major was, ironically enough, Kagari B7 in May of 2022. At Kagari B7, Toriguri entered the event as the 239th seed. The most notable thing about this tournament run was that it was mostly done through losers, with an early loss to Noi resulting in a 4-set losers run from Toriguri that was eventually ended 3-0 by Motsuan. TG ended up placing 65th out of over 700 entrants as the 239th seed, improving on his Kagari B6 placement. Toriguri would only attend 4 online tournaments between Kagari B7 and his next major, winning 3 of them and placing 2nd at only 1. Already we can see how Toriguri is improving, but for now just in his online results. Toriguri's next major was Mayasuma Top 8, 
where Tony Goody entered as the 85th seed. This was TG's highest seed yet, and he would outplace even this. Getting a good Game 5 win over Hiroki was good for TG, but it wasn't enough to prevent a Game 5 loss to Alice and a 3-0 loss to Sumosuto. Todiguri would finish at 65th as the 85th seed, but Alice and Sumosuto are both players that have top 8 majors, so these are not bad losses by any means, especially when TG was just one game away from upsetting Alice. After this, Todiguri entered three online tournaments and his first offline tournament that wasn't a major, Sabugeki 11. Classified as a super regional, Todiguri placed 9th, his best ever offline placement. Coming into the event as the 44th seed, TG not only went on the best run of his career, but got the best upsets of it too, defeating Subo Subo, T, the letter, and I'm, eventually losing to Sigma and Yoshi for a final placement of 9th as the 44th seed. While this wasn't a major, TG had almost made top 8 at an offline event for the very first time. And, perhaps most notably, Tori Goody was put on stream of an offline tournament for the first time ever, truly exposing our hero to the eyes of the world for the very first time. Tori Goody had now proved to himself that he had the potential to go the distance. It was just a question of how long it would take. Tori Goody would place 33rd at Mayasuma Top 9 right after this, his best placement at an offline major yet. At this tournament, TG suffered losses to Nao and Sumo Suto, but both sets going to a Game 3. Now is one of the two best Marios in Japan and one of their most underrated top players, and Sumo Suto is the Dr. Mario main that went on a Cinderella run and placed third at this very tournament. Yeah, that major that Doc made top 3 at? That was this tournament. After Mayasuma top 9, however, we really didn't see Toriguri continue the explosive rise that he had seemed to be on. For the rest of 2022, TG didn't see many notable performances in terms of placements other than a third place finish at Dawn 9, while Yes was very impressive, only had 44 entrants, and thus wasn't the breakout performance that Tori Goody was looking for. Combined with a 65th at Mayasuma Top 10 and a 25th at Seibugeki 12, Tori Goody seemed to have hit a wall in his progress to the top. Many people would have given up, or at this point considered switching characters in an attempt to deal with the problem matchups, or, you know, being a bottom tier. However, it's around this time, going from 2022 to 2023, that we see a shift in our hero. As you may have been able to notice from my screenshots, TG entered less and less online tournaments. At the beginning of 2022, Tori Goody would attend up to 10 Wi-Fi weeklies between major tournaments, but by the end of the year, had basically stopped attending Wi-Fi tourneys altogether except for the Mayasuma Champion Series, which he was consistently placing top 8 at these days. This trend continued headed into 2023, and in March of the new year, Tori Goody attended his final online tournament to this very day, Mayasuma Champion Series 25, where he placed 2nd. Why did TG stop attending online tournaments when they had been such a key part of his life for the last year? Well, it's because Tori Goody was changing. Up to this point, he, and in fact Banjo as a whole, was this obscure Wi-Fi oddity that was a bottom 5 character at their very lowest. Tori Goody had managed a few upsets and good runs, sure, but that wasn't his goal anymore. He wanted to change the way that people thought about him and his character. He wanted to prove to the world that Banjo and Kazooie was not some bottom tier irrelevant character, but a real potent threat in the right hands. And for TG, those right hands were his very own. It was time to do some serious grinding, some serious labbing, and some serious work if Tori Goody wanted to achieve the impossible, something he had almost grasped at Seibugeki 11. Tori Goody needed to make top 8 at a major with solo Banjo. 2023 didn't start great for our hero. With a 65th place finish at Umebura SP9, a 49th at Kagaribi 9, and a 65th at Mayasuma Top 11, as well as a disappointing 49th place finish at Sebugeki 13, which wasn't even a major, it seemed as if Tori Goody's 2023 was off to a terrible start. However, this was only the beginning of the year, and as they say, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Delta 3 was an oasis in a desert, a wonderful placement among a sea of lesser ones. You could consider Delta 3 to be Tori Goody's breakout performance, and while it certainly is his first truly stunning tournament, I think there's still a tourney later on down the line that I consider to be the true mark of his meteoric rise. Delta 3 was not considered to be a major, instead being a super regional, but it wasn't the tier of the tournament that was impressive. For TG, Delta 3 was all about the wins. Tori Goody came into Delta 3 as the 47th seed, 
first defeating Akakikusu 3-1 and Kachipi 3-0. The win over Akakikusu specifically is noted by Liquipedia to be Todiguri's first ever notable win. And while I can think of multiple wins that we've already covered that are very notable, this is the first win that TG has obtained over someone that was on the ult rank 2022, which is the metric Liquipedia uses to denote if someone is a notable win. So yes, Delta 3 saw Todiguri's first ever notable win, as funny as that is to say given what we just spent several minutes talking about. However, as notable as the Akikikusu win is, it wasn't as notable as the next win TG would get, as Todiguri went up against and defeated Takara, the best Ken in the world in a close Game 5 set, a set that criminally wasn't uploaded online. The win over Takara allowed TG to enter into top 8, and from winner's side no less. This was TG's best ever performance so far at an offline event, major status or not. Once here though, Tordy Goody would lose to Atelier in winner semis 3-1, dropping into loser's quarters and first defeating IC's main Futuri no Kiyomi A 3-0, moving into loser's semi-finals. Here, Tordy Goody would have to face off against Takara yet again. Now, a lot of people will probably be thinking that this is it for TG. Just like Tweak did at Glitch 7, Tori Goody must have been using matchup unfamiliarity to defeat his opponents, right? Now that Takara is used to Banjo's tricks, he must wash TG in the run back. Right? <laughs> <laughs> And in quite the reversal of expectations, Todiguri wiped Takara 3-0, double eliminating the Ken main and moving into losers finals. However, unfortunately, it was TG's turn to be double eliminated, as he lost to Atelier again 3-1 in losers finals for a final placement of third as the 47th seed. With multiple big upsets and a top 3 finish under his belt, Todiguri left Delta 3 a winner, on top of the world, and surely it was only up from here, right? Tori Goody's next few tournaments were bad, with one exception that we'll be talking about in a second. But after Delta 3, Tori Goody first participated in his final online tournament ever, before placing 33rd at Wave 4, 17th at Delta 4, 65th at Kagari B10, his worst major performance in a hot minute, as well as 13th at Wave Champions 2, which wasn't even a major, paired with 25th at Mayasuma Top 13, a 17th at Sebigeki 14, and lastly a 13th at Wave Champions 3, which, yet again, wasn't even a major. The only good notable thing about any of the tourneys I just mentioned was that Tori Goody got another notable win at Wave Champions 2, defeating Atelier in a close game 5 set, getting revenge from being double eliminated at Delta 3. However, the eagle-eyed viewers among you may realize that I skipped over one major tournament in that list. The next tournament that we'll be going over is that very tournament, which I consider truly to be Tori Goody's breakout performance, Mayasuma Top 12. Mayasuma Top 12, just like Delta 3, was a phenomenal performance in a sea of lesser ones. However, while Delta 3 was an oasis in a desert, Mayasuma Top 12 felt like El Dorado, the city of gold, in the middle of a nuclear wasteland. That's because this tournament was a true major, unlike Delta 3, which means that it's even more amazing that Todiguri's run was as insane as it was. Tori Goody, coming off of the poor performances we talked about earlier, came into Mayasuma Top 12 as the 57th seed. But Tori Goody knew that this was his chance to make waves, and oh boy, make waves he did. Tori Goody started off the weekend by working his way through his pool, defeating Mises and Lucia 2-0, as well as defeating a notable Japanese Rob main Kuroponzu in a 2-1. That's when Tori Goody had to go up versus Mudes. Hi, yes, American jump scare, Mudes was in Japan. This was that one weekend leading up to Kagari B10 where a ton of NA players all went to Japan. Mudes, Lima, Cosmos, Send, DeBuzz, Riddles, and Spargo were all in Japan around this time, as well as many other less notable ones. Spargo was the only notable absence at Mayasuma Top 12, but basically every other NA competitor who was going to Kagari B10 also showed up here at Mayasuma. And, if you remember from this tournament, NA players were dropping left and right. Send, Cosmos, DeBuzz, Lima, all of them fell to Japanese players, a lot of them not even top Japanese players, before ever making it deep into the bracket. And now, it's time to see if Mudes would suffer the same fate at the hands of today's hero, Todiguri. <laughs> And in a 2-0 sweep, Todiguri defeated the best peach in the world, creating one of the bracket's biggest upsets. 
By the way, of all the North American players that tried to invade Japan, only one of them actually managed to make it into the top 8, that player being Riddles who placed 4th. After this win versus Mudes, Todiguri defeated Ron 2-0 as well as Umeki in a game 5 set. Really makes you think that TG swept Mudes 2-0 but then went game 5 versus Umeki. Anyways, Todiguri was on the verge, the precipice of making top 8 at a major, of achieving the goal he had been striving for for so long, but then he had to fight Akola. Yeah, sorry TG, no amount of plot armor can save you from that. After losing 3-0 to Akola, TG dropped into losers and lost again to Hedo 3-0, being eliminated at 9th place as the 57th seed, one hair away from finally making top 8 at a major. But some of you might be wondering something. If nearly every single NA player was upset, not just Mutes, and TG didn't even make top 8, why am I calling this tournament Toriguri's breakout performance? Well, simply put, it was the tournament that made everyone realize he existed. By this point, Toriguri had been working his way up in the background. Everything we covered before this was a silent rise, an ascent only noticed by his fellow countrymen and anyone obsessed with the Japanese scene. And while, yes, Mudes wasn't the only American player to be upset at Maya Sima Top 12, he was the first, only being compounded by the fact that it was such a big upset. But the other factor in this? Well, it's Banjo. The bottom tier character, the DLC that everyone forgot about, the character that people quite literally forget is even in the game. Every other NA player got upset by at least a high tier character, but this set here? Mudes was the first player upset at Mayasuma in the biggest upset and by the character that no one expected to make these upsets. You gotta understand, for the average NA viewer who wasn't keeping track of the tournament, learning about this upset went a little something like this. Oh, Mutes in Japan? Uh, did he make top 8? Who'd he beat? He lost. To who? Who the heck is Tootie Guri? Banjo? The reason I call this tournament Tori Guri's big breakout performance is because this is the tournament where everyone across the world of Smash, not just Japan, knew how good he was, and more importantly, that he existed at all. Finally, for seemingly the first time ever since Tweak's Glitch 7 run, there was a top level ish player piloting Banjo and Kazooie. Banjo mains and Banjo lovers everywhere united under this one banner to support a player that, for the first time in the game's lifespan, seemed bound to top beta major with one of the game's worst characters. For everyone watching, it seemed like it was only a matter of time. And they were right. On September 3rd, 2023, Mayasuma Top 14 took place. Only two Mayasumas ago, at Mayasuma Top 12, Toriguri had achieved the best placement of his career, as well as the attention of the world of Smash, and just a month prior had achieved an impressive fourth place finish at Toyota Grand Slam 15, classified as a Super Regional. On top of this, on June 27th of 2023, Toriguri was officially picked up by a sponsor, Team Moe's, who had also notably sponsored Ryuo. So, riding high on all of that momentum, Toriguri was looking to not only replicate his past peak from Mayasuma Top 12, but this time exceed it. Toriguri was determined to top 8 Mayasuma Top 14, a major. Toriguri came into the event as the 25th seed, starting off the weekend by getting through round 1 and round 2 pools, most notably getting wins over Zaki, the best King DDD player in the world, and Levi, a talented inkling man. Headed into round 3 though, Toriguri would lose in a team kill against the aforementioned Ryuo in a close game 5 set, dropping into losers pretty early on in bracket. Many players here would have been distraught, especially upon seeing Toriguri's next opponent, Hedo. Hedo had beaten Toriguri at Mayasuma Top 12 in the losers top 8 qualifier, so seeing Hedo again in his path so soon must have been a rough pull for Toriguri. Or so we thought. That's because, despite the fact that there's no VOD, Toriguri defeated Hedo in a Game 5 set, moving on in bracket. Speaking of Game 5 wins against big bodies, Toriguri next defeated Sasusoro, Japan's best solo Rob, in another Game 5 set. This meant that Toriguri was guaranteed 9th and now moved into the loser's top 8 qualifier. Here, Toriguri would have to fight Senra. Senra is Japan's best Jigglypuff who I dedicated an entire video to recently. Senra was going on his own legendary run here at Mayasuma Top 14, but only one of them could make it into the top 8. And that brings us back to where we opened this video. 
September 3rd, Osaka Kansai. Mayasuma Top 14, Losers Round 4. Senra vs. Todiguri, the Losers Top 8 qualifier at a major tournament. After so long, so many hours spent grinding, and so many attempts that came up just short, this was Todiguri's chance to finally make the impossible possible. The character that so many people wanted in Smash and finally received after decades, only to be met with pure disappointment. So many attempts, so many roadblocks, but never once dropping faith in himself or his character. To change history, to change perceptions, to make everyone realize once and for all that Banjo and Kazooie was not some Wi-Fi bottom tier, he needed to win. And he did. In the end, Todiguri defeated Senra 3-0, moving into top 8 from loser's side, the first time Banjo has ever done so since Tweak's run at Glitch 7, and the first time ever that it's been done with solo Banjo. This feat had been done single-handedly by Todiguri, pushing the character's meta to the absolute limit like no one else had ever done. Everyone wrote off Banjo as the one bad DLC character, or that he was a bottom tier Wi-Fi cheeser, but Todiguri proved everyone wrong. Todiguri would then move into top 8 from loser's side, where he would unfortunately lose to Tsubaki 3-1 for a final placement of 7th as the 25th seed. But that didn't matter. The barrier had been broken, the walls torn down. A low tier now had made top 8 at a major all by himself. No secondaries or pockets needed. What could be better than that? Well, what about winning? Since Todiguri's top 8 finish at Mayasuma Top 14, he attended several tournaments afterward, the two majors in there being Delta 5 and Kagari B11, both of which resulted in a 25th place finish. Additionally, a 13th at Jingi 2 and a 7th at Wave Champion 6 were both semi-disappointing results, but both were overridden by the successes at Wave Champions 4 and Ikusuma 1, both of which resulted in Todiguri winning his first ever large offline tournaments. I actually made an entire video about Todiguri's Wave Champions 4 run, so if you want an in-depth look at it, go watch that video. Since I don't want to repeat myself, I'll just briefly mention that Todiguri defeated Wada, Yuzu, Motsunabe, Taike, and Chicken, all in either 3-2s or 3-1s, for a first place finish as the second seed. Ikesume 1 saw Todiguri defeat Lamozuna 3-2 to make top 8, where Todiguri beat Gorioka 3-1 as well as Jagaimo 3-1 to make it into Grands, winner's side. And although Jagaimo reset the bracket 3-1, Todiguri won that reset in yet another 3-1, placing first as the third seed of the event. That brings us to the present day. At the time I'm writing this script, December 28th, 2023, the last two tournaments that we're covering today are the most recent that Todiguri has entered. Firstly is his most recent tournament, Toyota Grand Slam 16, which I made a video about that solely focused on Senra's run. TG finished a slightly disappointing 9th after being upset by DDD main Goody in the Losers Top 8 qualifier. Wait, Goody beat Todi Goody? That's odd. Anyways, the main focus here is going to be the last tournament we're covering today, TG's most recent major, Mayasuma Top 15 Final. The final tournament with Maitakun's involvement was always going to be a banger tourney, with seemingly all of Japan coming together to celebrate their beloved TO. Todiguri was no exception to this, and he came into the tournament as the 17th seed, getting a good win over Fudada Ramen, the Game & Watch and Isabel co-main, as well as benefiting from Yuzu DQing. However, this meant that Todiguri had to go up versus Miya, and as you may have been able to predict, this set did not go well for Todiguri, as he'd lose 3-0 versus the Game & Watch, dropping into losers. Once here, Todiguri defeated his old enemy Atelier in a 3-1 set before moving on and defeating Captain Falcon main Jogibu 3-1 to make it into the top 8 loser side qualifier. TG's opponent here would be Komei, who had upset Yoshidora earlier on in bracket and now went up versus TG for top 8 at Mayasuma top 15. And ultimately, Todiguri defeated Komei in a close game 5 set, moving into top 8 loser side of a major for the second time in his career and solo Banjo's second ever major top 8. Now here, Todiguri had to go up versus Doramigi, the best solo minman in the world and the best one in Japan right now since Proto is semi inactive at the moment. Now, Banjo minman seems like a terrible matchup, but let me tell you, TG has defeated worse odds before. <laughs> いや、
ショックジャンプおいてこれは届かない<笑>粘りに粘ったフルセットを制したのはトリグリだ And in the end, Toriguri defeated Dormigi in a close game 5 set, surpassing his previous peak of 7th, this time being guaranteed 5th at a major. And Toriguri would indeed place 5th, as he'd next lose a close game 5 set versus Snow, one of Japan's best Marios, for a final placement of 5th as the 17th seed. That wraps up the entire competitive career of Toriguri, which, yes, we did just cover the entirety of in a single video. Toriguri has single handedly proven the viability of his character, previously thought a bottom tier, as well as proven himself to be a true top player in Japan. With two major top eights under his belt, I can only see more coming in the near future. And no matter who you are, you can find yourself rooting for TG. He's the bottom tier hero of Smash Ultimate right now, more so than any of the Little Max or Ganon. Dwarfs out there. People have wanted Banjo and Kazooie in Smash for decades because, let's be honest, he deserves it. But when he came out, many people felt disappointed, maybe even betrayed by Nintendo, as the character they had been waiting for for so long was, put simply, really bad. But Toriguri didn't care about any of that. He pushed this character as far as he's ever come and will continue to push in the near future and beyond. Toriguri represents all the people who screamed with excitement when they saw the Banjo trailer for the first time. All of the inner children whose dreams came true with that single moment. And every single person who grew up with the Banjo and Kazooie games. That's what Toriguri represents. And for that, he's one of Smash Ultimate's greatest heroes in the competitive scene today. Bringing this video all the way around to where we started. We have Tweak. Tweak, after facing some slumps in tournaments and problems with Diddy Kong in certain matchups, has started to lab a certain character again. That's right, Tweak is picking Banjo back up, labbing the crap out of him and posting the clips of it on Twitter. It's really funny how we started this video with Tweak's Banjo run, and now we're ending it with him picking the character back up after previously losing faith. And you know what? You have one person to thank for that Toadie Goody. That's going to be it for today's video. Before I go, shout out to my patrons, Seth Laster, f a r s c o 3 3 3 and my tier 2 patrons, Iltis and Diamond Blaze. Additionally, shout out my YouTube members, Storm t r o i p e r Loco Soco, Diarrhea, d i c h o Jr., Defective, Orangabang, Fan of, and my tier 2 members, Monk Jean, Wu Tang Forever. Additionally, shout out goes to my tier 3 patron, Ocean Man, who says, Rister Mice is sorry for playing Min Min. If you want to support me using any of these methods, links are in the description below. I hope you've enjoyed today's video, and until tomorrow, I've been Rister Mice, and thank you all so very much for watching.